name is Stephen Popkus. This is my office where I write science fiction and build things. You can see projects and equipment behind me. I'm sure this is as new to you as it is to me. I apologize in advance for the jump cuts and lighting changes. I'm very unpracticed at this sort of thing and I didn't have a long time to do it. So let's get on with it. This is from my new book, Dance Mechanique that will have been released on July 5th when you see this. It's about a singing software robot named Dot that has developed the ability to deeply affect her audience to the point they change their lives. John is one of the main characters. Shez is his daughter. Sigurd and Arnold are their traveling companions. You can imagine what Dot heads are. Dot heads composed an elastic community. When Shez and John decided to break camp and continue east, Arnold and Sigurd decided to travel with them. But no one else did. The remaining community waved to them, wished them well, and promised to see them in St. Louis. The tiny car had gone from intimate to crowded, but they rolled the windows down and eased the press by leaning outside to get one-armed tans. John continued to read the Bible, and on Saturday he decided he wanted to go to church. The other stared at him. You're getting strange, Pops, offered Chez. Strange isn't bad, you understand, said Sigurd. Why? asked Arnold. John held up the reader. I've been reading all this to try to get a handle on change. Change happens, said Sigurd. You can't modify it. You can't modify change? John shook his head. I disagree. I think you can do it well or you can do it badly. This book has all sorts of stories about them both, but it seems to me I should listen to someone else, someone who's read it too, someone beyond you clowns. We're in Colorado, said Arnold. There are probably a lot of churches here. Which one? Check the review, suggested Chez. Good idea. Sigurd brought out his phone. Church is a commodity like anything else, right? People review commodities. Let's see what we find. Godfinder.com, said Shez. There's a Godfinder app. What does it say? John tried to look over her shoulder. It's like a dating site, she said. It asks a bunch of questions. Do you have a denomination in mind? No. Are you a fundamentalist? John stared at her. I don't know what that means. Sigurd leaned over the seat. She means, do you believe in the literal truth of the Bible? Normal people do that? Sure, said Sigurd. That's a broad definition of normal, said Arnold. Hey, Sigurd turned back to Arnold. We're going on a long-distance trip to see a software robot sing. Arnold shrugged. Point taken. John ignored them. I am not a fundamentalist. You're a seeker, Shez declared. What's that? Someone who can't make up their mind, offered Sigurd. Shut up, said Shez. Someone who's looking for answers but hasn't found any. Sure, said John, uncertain. I guess... Wow, she scrolled her phone. They really like you now. I'm getting pings from all over the state. You're an uncommitted market, said Sigurd, just like an 18-year-old woman, a young consumer, an independent voter. Everybody wants you. She scowled at him. Shut up. No offense. Offense taken. Great, John looked outside for a moment. Maybe this is a bad idea. No, said Shez. We just have to find the right church. How about this one? Zechariah Baptist Church. Everyone welcome. Approach God here. Steamboat Springs, just a couple of hours away. Shez looked up at him. Look, they've got Bible study tonight. I like the book of Zechariah. It's settled, said Arnold. We grab a place in Steamboat, and you can go tomorrow on Sunday. You come back when you're done. John looked at them, one face at a time. Okay, let's do that. John didn't go to church on Sunday. Instead, he left them sleeping in the room. The Hotel Gaunt was as odd as its name. It was a narrow building. From the lobby, John could see a bar and a marijuana deli across the street. The clerk was paging through images on the desktop. He looked up. Can I help you? Are there any churches open at this hour? The man looked at it. Walking distance? If possible. Church of the Apostolic Conversion, four blocks north. I don't know what they do this time of night, but they're always open. The mountain air was crisp, even in summer, not cold, but dry as old wood, dry as sand, dry as a clever thought, or a cold reproof. The Church of the Apostolic Conversion was in an old building that had not been built as a church, but converted from a house. Given its age, when it was built, it could have been a mansion. Now it had been hollowed out. The lines of the building in the front porch marked it as once being a home, but only that home's last address. A man sat on the front porch under a dim bulb reading a Bible, his clerical collar clear in the glare. His face was broad, pockmarked, and discolored. His hair was not yet fully gray, but it started to give way to it. He was not a big man, but he had a measured look, as if he had decided to look and sit just so for reasons of his own. 
John liked his smile. John stood uncertainly on the sidewalk. Hey there, said the minister. Come on up. John came up the stairs and took his proffered hand. John Doretto. Avery Shank, said the minister. You can sit or go in. I like to keep it open on Saturday nights in case someone wants to pray, but you can go in and just sit if you want. Avery gave him a searching look. Sit down, he said. I'm guessing you've never seen the inside of a church. John nodded. True enough. Avery looked down the street. People come along and stop sometimes, undecided. I'd like to sit here and give them encouragement in case they're too afraid or embarrassed to come in. He looked back up at John. You're not religious, but you end up in front of my church. Isn't that interesting? My daughter thinks I'm a seeker. Avery nodded. Seek yourself a seat. I'll get a crick in my neck from looking up at you. John sat down stiffly. So what are you seeking, God? John shook his head slowly. No, I'm pretty sure that doesn't interest me. Well, that's the main thing you can seek in a church. John leaned forward, his elbows on his knees. Something happened to me. Something changed me. I'm trying to understand it. A still voice crying in the wilderness? Maybe, John thought for a moment. I've been doing a lot of reading and keep coming back to the Bible. It talks about change all the time. Paul on the road to Damascus. Matthew following Jesus. And it talks about things that don't change, like the Pharisees, like the Babylonians. Babylonians changed. Shadrach in the furnace showed that. John nodded. There's always push to change. There's resistance to change. Sometimes in the Bible, change is something you bring about. Other times, it's something to resist. And every time I think I've got it, there's something in the Bible that disagrees with me. Other times, when I'm lost, I find the answer. In God. John shook his head. No. In the way people change, or don't change, or fight change, or slide away with it. Avery watched him a moment. So, if you're not interested in God, and you are interested in the Bible, what are you doing here? John leaned back. I'm not sure. When I read the Bible, I get a sense of how things go together, how things fit, like a building or a tower, some kind of structure, a feeling if I could just boil down all this stuff and filter it, I'd get a wonderful set of principles I could apply anywhere for anything. That would be the salvation of Jesus. I think Jesus and God would be some of the stuff I'd boil out. Avery laughed. Well, that's a lovely bit of blasphemy. Yeah, John said, felt embarrassed. Sorry, I don't mean to be insulting. I'm not insulted. Avery waved towards the inside of the church. He died and came back from the dead. There's precious little you can do to insult that. John nodded. Thanks. He beat his arms on the chair for a long time. I've been reading a lot. You know who Einstein was, right? Well, yes. He was a pretty famous character. E equals MC squared and all that. Right. John listened to the night. They thought they had physics all wrapped up before he came along. They had everything pictured as waves. Well, waves needed something to travel in, so they invented ether. You couldn't see it. You couldn't touch it. But it was all around you and affected how things worked. Einstein came along and said, basically, well, there might be ether. There might not be ether. But here's a way for light to travel that doesn't need it. John held his hands as if he were holding a bowl. They had that built this entire structure that needed something deep to keep it together. Einstein came along and said, it's pretty, but you don't need it. I think we have rules and concepts and structures that we built that need stuff, like God, just because we built it that way. But if we can create a new structure, a better structure, that stuff can be left behind. Avery gave him a hard look. You think God's something we invented just to make ourselves feel better. John shrugged. Well, that's harsh, but maybe. Avery watched the street for a moment. This late, there were a few cars and a scattering of pedestrians. You're lucky that nobody came tonight that actually needs me. I'd boot your ass out of here. He turned back to John, reached down next to his chair, and picked up a Bible. You are a dilettante. You pick and choose what you want to see in this and discard the rest. There are thousands of years of material here, looked at and analyzed all that time to figure out the essence of God's meanings. He spread it open. Pick any page in this book and it's a discussion of man's relationship with God. Sure, there's change in it. Human life is all about change, but that is ancillary to the fundamental point of the work. That change you're so interested in is a consequence of that relationship, not the focus. Who are you to challenge that? Avery's face was written with passion. His voice thundered. Years of preaching filled every nook and cranny of it. He was right, though. John was casting aside the intent of every editor, collector, and translator since the Hittites. The Bible was a distillation of those efforts, the natural product of generations 
of pruning, creation, and thought. He should honor that, but he didn't have to subscribe to it. I think I've misused you, John said slowly. I found a lot of value in that book, but not the God part. Shez was wrong. I'm not a seeker. I didn't come here for answers. I've got answers. I came here to test them. Avery stared at him. What do you mean? Like you said, every passage in there is dripping with God. I'm not using that, but it's still there. Like building something out of the remainder. How do I know if it stands on its own? It's like I'm testing a vaccine by exposing the test animal to the disease. John pointed at the Bible in Avery's hand. There's value there for me, but it's not the same as the value it has for you. He stood up. I've been terribly unfair. I'm sorry. Avery caught his sleeve. You do know you're going to hell for this, right? Well, that's a terrible incentive. It calls into question everything else the New Testament says. Avery drew back from him. John felt terrible. I'm sorry. It seems like wanting to believe or not believe in God is an emotional decision. It's like love. It's either there or it isn't. In my case, it isn't. He started to go down the steps. Don't go. Avery stood up. I was wrong. God wants me to be here tonight to talk to you. Don't go. John kept walking. Avery called after him. When you feel the angel of death near, you'll repent, and then it will be too late. John stopped and turned back to him. What does it say about God that he requires the threat of death to make someone believe in him? This is from a new book, House of Birds, that will be released in December. Things to know. On Earth, evolution has been shaped by an alien terraforming organism since the end of the Permian. Humans are a side project for her. There's a second terraformer that has been on Earth since 1885, and she's desperately trying to leave and take a substantial number of humans with her to terraform Venus. Ian Bones works for both of them. The Earth terraformer identifies herself to Ian as Georgette, the one intending to terraform Venus, called herself Percy. This section is from part one, which takes place on Earth prior to any changes on Venus and starts in Sequoia National Park. Ian walked by himself. Rolf cautioned him, be careful, I've got a few hungry mountain lions on the camps. Don't worry, Ian said, if something happens to me, the program is covered in my will. Well, thanks. That was the only thing I was worried about. Ian barely listened. Their research was not why he was here. These trees were the biggest, greatest organisms on the planet that he could see or feel or smell. They gave him the illusion that everything would ultimately be okay. After all, if one of these could last 3,000 years, there was hope for the rest of us, right? He was paying for reassurance. The adult sequoias crowded out the light and left nothing for the understory even walked on bare forest litter in silent, shadowy gloom. He saw several ground squirrels and one deer. Rolf's hungry mountain lion sat on a rock, ears forward, looking for her next meal. She didn't even twitch when Ian walked by. That depressed him. He should at least register as predator or prey. It didn't surprise him when Georgette walked from behind a huge tree, dragging one perfect hand along the bark. Her long, blonde hair fell down her back. She was dressed in a light jacket and slacks, the color matching the red bark of the sequoias. As always, it seemed she caught all the available light, and as always, he had to catch his breath when he saw her. Knowing what she was made no difference at all. I see why you like coming up here, she said in a soft voice. Maybe I shouldn't if you're here, she smiled. Have I spoiled it for you? Was this the last lonely place you could escape me? Georgette pouted. That's so sad. Ian pulled his eyes away from her. Everything seemed smaller with her here. You should have seen them in the Cretaceous. Georgia leaned against the trunk, spread her arms to hug it. They were everywhere. T-Rex walked around under them. Herds of ceratopsians, little tiny mammals. She held her thumb and forefinger a couple of inches apart, then returned to hugging the trees. I loved my dinosaurs. What do you want? Percy wants you to go to Missouri. I'm scheduled to leave in a few days. Of course you are. She came over and took his arm. Don't you think I made this park just perfect? This was intentional? Georgette shrugged. Can't I take credit for accidental beauty in something I made? Ian felt bludgeoned. How much of everything you've ever done was just an accident? Georgette shrugged, unconcerned. It's a little like bonsai. The artist shapes the tree, but the tree grows the only way it can. Is that how you made us? Oh no, six days and then I rested. You've read the documentation. 
Ian shook his head in exasperation. Why does it have to be this way? Couldn't we just take who we need? You can do what you want with the rest. Georgette gave him a tinkling laugh. Oh, Ian, what is it you think I'm doing? Destruction for destruction's sake? Yes. <sighs> you poor darling, this is just practice. Practice for what? Georgette danced a perfect pirouette and bowed to the tree. You are taking advantage of events in place long before you were born. She cast the idea away with a wave of her hand. Percy's needs in your very, very tiny human lifespan drive the timetable. But such things would have happened regardless. So I gathered. I know. She pinched his cheek and there was a jolt of electricity through him. Why are you here? He said, his teeth clenched. You could have reminded me in lichen patterns on the tree. True enough. Georgette held his arm and looked around. I like your company. I like to poke at you. It makes Percy suspicious of my motives. It tweaks your motivation, and it demonstrates I'm following our agreement. Right, Ian said bitterly. I am caught between a hammer and an anvil. Ian, our love means nothing to you? She grinned wickedly at him, danced around one of the sequoias. Ian followed and found only a pile of leaf litter against the trunk. He returned to the cabin and ate with Rolf while he looked over the project's data. Rolf thought the future of the sequoias was promising. Ian knew better. This section is from House of Birds Part 2, where Part 1 involved abducting people for Venus colonization. Part 2 is how those abductees adapt to Percy's newly terraformed Venus. They are living in fenced-in camps. The long Venus night is approaching and they don't have enough food. However, a large and mysterious animal has been discovered in the lagoon, and the only bait they have is themselves. Ian is the same from part one. Chitra is his lover. Frieder is a friend to them both. Frieder held a rope in his hand. Francesca and Chitra were ready at the shore of the lagoon. Each had a grass rope tied to her waist. Half a dozen men and women each held those ropes other end. Ian and his crew waited next to them, holding improvised harpoons. Each of the harpoons had a rope trailing from it. Frieder's crew had the net suspended across the surface of the lagoon at the narrowest point, but high enough so the fish could swim under. Rock weights were tied to the bottom of the net to hold it down when it was finally released. Go, said Ian. Frieder couldn't have said a word. His mouth was too dry for worry about Chitra. Francesca and Chitra waded into the water, splashing as much as they could. Both Ian's crew and Frieder's watched the water. After an hour of splashing, Frieder caught a glimpse of something under the surface. Be ready, he called. Ian's crew moved closer to the bank. Okay, come out, said Ian. Not yet, Chitra splashed some more. Not till it gets here. Freer saw it past them. It's not a fish, Freer yelled. It's more like a crocodile. What do we do? Everybody looked at Ian. Ian looked at Freer. Freer looked at Chitra. We go with the plan, cried out Chitra. Watch for it. Freer's crew dropped the net and started pulling it towards Chitra and Francesca as they tried to run for shore. The crocodile seemed to sprint towards them, a low bulge of water showing its speed. Pull her in, screamed Frieder. The crew on shore started bringing in the rope as fast as possible. Francesca reached the point where her legs were out of the water and began to run. Chitra fell. The crew dragged her through a meter of water. The animal reared its head and swung it around, striking Chitra and tossing her a good seven meters back into the water. The rope broke. It was no crocodile. Frieder saw it turn. He let go of the net and ran towards her, reached down and grabbed a rock the size of a football. The thing shot towards Chitra and, reaching up to drop on her, its mouth open. Frieder let fly with everything he had. The rock caught it in the back of its throat. It veered off, shaking its head violently. Frieder grabbed Chitra and dragged her to shore. Get it, cried Ian. He and his crew ran into the water, throwing their harpoons at the thing, holding onto the ropes as it thrashed. Frieder's crew brought the net up to it. In a moment, its thrashing wrapped the net around it, and all of them began dragging it ashore. It began to weaken. Clearly, Frieder's rock had lodged somewhere vital. Frieder bent over Chitra. Are you all right? Chitra looked at herself. She nodded, stunned, looked at Frieder. You are bleeding. Frieder looked at his arm. It had been cut across the forearm. He flexed his hand. Still works. Chitra grabbed him and applied pressure. Frieder yelped and sat down. The thing was shaking feebly snapping at anything that came near it, but after a moment it gave a huge seizure, knocking three of the spear carriers down. It locked into a single rigid arc, then it relaxed and died. Son of a bitch, said Ian as he staggered out of the water. He ran over to the drop to his knees and held Chitra. I thought you were lost. I was. Ian straightened, but for Frieder, he held out his hand. Thank you, he said. Thank you so, so much. At that moment, Frieder could look right into him. 
could see the love Ian had for Chitra, his brokenness as well as his tenderness. Damn, he thought, I actually like him. Freer grasped Ian's hand in return. You're welcome. The beast was strange. It had a blunt triangular head that resembled a short-nosed crocodile, but its tail was stubby and its legs ended in paddles. What the hell is it? Chitra poked it. It's meat, said Freer. We need to read in the outline how to dry it. It's that, said Ian as he knelt next to it, but it's also a pliosaur. Freer looked down at it. What's that? A marine reptile that's been extinct for 70 million years. Oh, said Chitra. Yeah, Ian snorted. Welcome to Venus. Let's get you patched up, said Chitra. She led Frieder back towards the buildings as Ian and the others began the butchering. In the kitchen, she pointed to a table. Get on there. She brought out a bowl of hot water and lay it in the bundle next to him. She cleaned the wound with leaves and water. No soap to speak of nor alcohol. We'll see if you die of infection. This is going to hurt. She took three wooden skewers from the bundle and poked them through the skin on either side of the wound. Freer gasped for each one. What the hell? Wait, it gets worse. She broke the ends and bent them across, pinching the skin together. Freer made a tiny shriek. Chitra smiled at him. Should have given you a bullet to clamp your jaw on, but I'm fresh out of bullets. What? Never mind, it's an American thing. No needle, no thread. These are boiled, at least. Best staples I can make. She wrapped a bandage of broad leaves around his arms and tied it off with brass string. The leaves are boiled, too. Turns out they act sort of like cloth if you cook them long enough. She looked at him critically. In a couple of hours, you'll be feverish. There's no way I can sterilize a wound like that. Well, like you said, we'll see if I die of infection. Right. We are who we are now. She stared at him. Then she kissed him, deep and long. They parted. That's for saving my life, she said. She slipped off her grass shorts and top. Freer stared at her longingly. I don't need a reward. Chitra kissed him again and pulled off his shorts. I'm not rewarding you. She climbed up on the table. We're way, way past that. That's a wrap. I hope you've enjoyed the readings. Dance Mechanique is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other places. House of Birds, when it's released in December, will be available in the same places. Both books, as well as my others, are available at bookviewcafe.com or my website, www.stephenpopkiss.com. www.stephenpopkiss.com is also where to sign up for my mailing list to get my bi-weekly blog and announcements of upcoming events. Thanks for watching.